I'm going to say that again. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I, for I forgot to flip the uh, little mute switch. So um, am I all good now? I think I'm all good. I'm always getting in trouble with the sound. All good? No worries. Always getting in trouble with the sound man, but that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> it's good to have sound people in the sound booth because they're the ones we can blame when something goes wrong. <laughs> It's a thankless job, but they do an outstanding job out there trying to get the sound uh, right. But it's really good to be back here. Um, <clears throat> I was just saying to Pastor Matt before, last time I was here, we were facing that way. Is that right? Is that right, uh, Darren? It's always been this way? Like even back to the 90s? 1890s? <laughs> I don't know whether, no, this, is, this is Queensland, it doesn't matter. Just, uh, <clears throat> uh, if I can just, uh, can I ask a question to you Queenslanders? Can you fix the M1, please? I oh, know, just, just a question. <laughs> just, just an idea. Uh, but I know, uh, <clears throat> we've got to be thankful, eh? We could be in um, riding horse and cart, but it's very good to be here in uh, Queensland and to see so many new faces. Wow. Uh, I was going to say there's some old faces, uh, like Brad Lanahan, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, he's only visiting too, that's right, but so many new faces, at least new to me, so that's a wonderful thing, and to see just a full building uh, this morning, that is so good, and uh, it's good to have my wife Robin here, if you haven't met Robin, please come and say hello to her after the service this morning, um, <clears throat> thank you for praying for us over the years, and I, I have preached here many times in the past, just not for a while, so it's wonderful to be back. And I know there are people praying uh, for the meeting right now in different parts of, uh, of Australia. I am very blessed uh, in the ministry that I have um, a lot of people praying for me when I preach. So that is a, that is a blessing. <clears throat> All right, take our Bibles, please. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And keep a bookmark in Psalm 34 and also go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Psalm 34 and 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> My text verse for this morning is verse number 8, Psalm 34 and verse number 8. And I'm going to read that verse and then we'll pray and then we'll get to the message this morning. Psalm 34, verse 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed or blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I want to speak to you for a few minutes this morning on the taste test. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today, which is the Lord's day, your special day. And Lord, we do meet. And Father, we want to praise you and worship you and honor you this day we bless your your name and we give you our give you our all at this very moment and we pray dear lord as we look at your word for just a few minutes this morning lord i know it's 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 hot and sticky this morning but i pray that we will concentrate as best we can and i pray most importantly that the spirit of god will have his way this morning uh, through the preacher via the word of god to hearts this morning please work amongst us lord especially if there's someone here this morning dear lord that does not know christ as their savior may they see their desperate need today for those of us who are saved lord may we be encouraged uh, lord and even thrilled as we look at your word and we pray also for wherever the word of god is preached in this great country of ours at this very time please bless we ask in jesus name amen the Bible says, don't turn there, Psalm 139, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God made the universe, including planet Earth, uh, I believe 100% in six literal days. Done. You say, how could God do that? I don't know how he did it, but God is God. Uh, and God is very clever, made the universe, everything in here. And, and the Bible says in the book of Genesis, when he made this world and uh, Adam and Eve and everything that's in the world, it was good. And not only was it good, it was very good. Do you know that God, uh, and, and God made, uh, we are his crowning uh, creation, that is mankind. 
When God made us, he gave us senses, S-E-N-S-E-S, senses. In other words, there's the five senses, okay? Because God understood, realised that, it, it, you know, it was no good making all the wonderful things uh, in the world if we couldn't sense those things. God gave us the senses. For example, uh, God gave us the, uh, the sense of um, seeing. Can you imagine if everything was grey? One shade of grey. Could you imagine that? Uh, and as some of you here might be colourblind. Uh, yeah, oh, that's right, everything. It meant that everything was grey. Now, I don't mind the colour grey, but it'd, it'd be a bit drab if everything was grey. Um, <clears throat> you imagine, uh, and by the way, how many colours are there in the rainbow? Seven. I've never memorised those colours. I know there's indigo and violet uh, in there somewhere. There's seven colours in God's rainbow. There's actually another rainbow they talk about. Have a guess how many colours in that rainbow? There's six. That tells you something, doesn't it? But anyway, we won't go down that, that rabbit trail this morning. Uh, maybe we should. No, we won't. We won't go down that rabbit trail this morning. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, <clears throat> God uh, created music. God created music. And, and by the way, on that first point... The second rainbow is a counterfeit rainbow. God created music. Do you know how many notes there are on the piano? Now, I know there's 88 notes on a full-size piano, but how many different notes are there? There's seven. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. There's no H, okay? It goes back to A again. There's seven notes. Um, <clears throat> could you imagine if every, every tune was in the key of D minor? Now, I don't mind the key of D minor. I actually like Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Uh, my wife tends to think it's like a, uh, going to a funeral home, but I actually don't mind it. Uh, but I, I, I am thankful for major chords as well. But can you imagine if everything was in the chord of D minor? No, God has gave, given us music and he's given us ears to be able to decipher the notes. Because when God, and by the way, Satan has counterfeited music as well. He was the head honcho in, in heaven. He was the head chorister. He was the head, the head uh, music director in heaven, got thrown out of heaven. So he knows all about music and he has counterfeited music. You know, God gave us the sense of taste. Guess however, uh, have you ever, did, did you, do you know about the seven major food groups? I'll tell you what they are. Steak, chocolate, coffee, ice cream, <laughs> chips, pizza and bacon. Uh, now, I just made that up, but, uh, uh, but I tell you what, I reckon, I reckon we'd be pretty close to there, as long as you've got the bacon on the end there. Uh, apologies to any Jewish people here. But uh, uh, there are, uh, um, God, how many tastes are there in the world? Now, being a British stock, you know, um, British cuisine isn't known to be, uh, I do like bangers and mash, uh, Yorkshire pudding, but um, us Aussies of British extraction, we're not known for our culinary expertise but uh, those from maybe Middle Eastern or Asian backgrounds they really know how to cook and they know all about spices and so on but God gave us this incredible sense of taste and the Bible says here the psalmist said taste and see that the Lord is good now if you had never ever seen an apple before and I was to say well I'll try and describe this fruit to you it's it's well they're not all red but usually they're red and they're shiny and then on the inside they're sort of juicy and they're maybe an off-white color or a yellow color and about the size of a cricket ball and and, and I could describe all that but the best way to for you to find out what an apple is like is to take a big munch a big bite out, out of an apple if, if your teeth are up to it <laughs> That's how you find out what an apple's like. That's what the psalmist said here. He said, listen, taste and see that the Lord is good. What is God really like? What is the God, the creator of the universe, the one that created the universe in six literal days, what is he really like? I'm glad you asked the question. Come over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And in the few minutes we have this morning, uh, <clears throat> it's... Uh, it, it's crazy to take everything out of this chapter. So there's a lifetime of teaching in the book of Peter. But I want to just pick out a few of the uh, little parts of Peter here that tell us some things about what God is like. You say, how do we know what God is like? We go to his word. This is God's word. This is God's love letter to mankind. And this tells us a lot about the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. What is God like? Here's the first thing. Come down here to uh, verse number 2. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 2, it says, elect according to the foreknowledge 
of God the Father. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, what's it saying here? Uh, it's not saying elected, it's saying elect, or we could say the elect. God's elect are elected according to God's foreknowledge. Now, I do not believe for one moment that God says, well, uh, I, I'm going I'm to choose that person to go to heaven. I'm going to choose that person to go to hell. They've got no choice about it. No, no, no. The Bible says whosoever will may come. Uh, God's not like that. God doesn't. Uh, but, but God knows who's going to be saved Amen. because he's God. Why? Because God is all-knowing. Now, the big fancy word for that is omniscience omniscience god knows everything as someone once said has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to god god never woke up one morning and thought oh i never thought of that uh for two reasons one because he knows everything and two because he never wakes up the bible says god doesn't slumber or sleep but god knows everything and he knows <clears throat> who is going to be saved that doesn't excuse us from <clears throat> the great commission not at all. God has chosen his children to be co-laborers in the gospel. That's our responsibility. Now, that's not to say we can understand. I can't get my head around the fact that God knows everything. But that's fine. We, we can't understand everything about God because he's so far above us. But we believe it because that's what the Bible says. We are God's elect according to his foreknowledge. He knows everything. The psalmist said that he knows my downsitting. He knows my uprising. If I go to heaven, he's there. If I go to hell, he's, he's there. You know, God knows what you thought yesterday. God knows what you're thinking right now. God knows what you're going to think tomorrow because he's God. That's part of his nature. He's omniscient. God knows everything. What's the second thing we can learn about God? Look down at verse number five. Well, let's go to verse four. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who, that's the saved, the, the elect, God's children, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So God is not only all-knowing or omniscient, God is all-powerful or omnipotent. That's the big theological term. God is all-powerful. And if God is able to save someone from their sins, guess what? He's able to keep them saved. You know, some people balk at the idea of becoming a Christian because they think, well, okay, I, I, I'll accept Christ into my life, but I can't, I can't keep going. I can't live that Christian life. I can't, I can't. It's not up to you. God does the saving. God does the keeping. That's why salvation is by faith. We are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2 tells us that. There's no works involved. The work was all done by Jesus on the cross. There's no works involved. If there's works, um, well, how, how, how many works do you need? If you've got to add some works to faith, what do you add? 1%? 80%? 0.01 of a percent? How many works do you have to add? And then if you've got to add works to salvation, you've got to keep doing those works. No, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That's a blessing. Because God, if God is able to save you, he is able to keep you. That's why Jesus said, when the Lord has you in his hand, he's got you. You're in his grip and no one can take him out of there. No one can take you out of there. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. <clears throat> what else is God like? And by the way, um, on those first two points, you need to make sure that you're part of God's elect. In other words, you need to make sure that you are part of God's family. And if, don't turn there. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. I'm not talking about being a church member. I'm not talking about being religious. I'm not talking about being, uh, having a reform life. I'm not talking about good works. I'm talking about, are you born again? Do, does God, <clears throat> it's not just, do you know God? Does God know you? Second Timothy chapter two, the Lord knoweth them that are his. So you better make sure this morning that you know 100% for sure that you are born again, that you are in God's family. You say, isn't that a bit presumptuous to, to say that? 
I'm glad you asked that question. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may, what's the word? K-N-O-W, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. You say, can, can, can you know for sure that you are saved? Yep, sure can. Because salvation is a no-so salvation, not a hope for the best salvation. So if you are not a Christian this morning, if you do not know 100% for sure that you are one of God's elect, that you are part of God's family, that you've been born again by the Spirit of God, hey, the good news is that you can, you can know today. You can know today. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. What else is God like? <clears throat> Look at verse number 16. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. God is all holy. What does this word holy mean? Well, it means a number of things. The obvious things that holy mean is that God is sinless. He is sinless. He's not able to sin. That's God. But holy also, <clears throat> the word actually means set apart or separate. And that is true. God is, is separate from his creation. We are made in the image of God, but God is separate. God is set apart. And there's a lesson for Christians. That's why the, Peter said there, be holy, just like God is holy. Be separate, be set apart from the world. We're not supposed to become more like the world. We're supposed to become more like Jesus. Now someone says, but hang on. Aren't Jesus and God two different persons? Well, they are, but they're one God. You see, God is the Father, Jesus is the Son, Holy Spirit is the Spirit. Three persons, not three gods, three persons, one God. But God is holy. He is holy. He is set apart. <clears throat> what else is God like? Look down at chapter, where are we here? Chapter 2. Verse 3, and here we have this word tasted again. If so be that ye have tasted, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. God is gracious. God is a gracious God. What is grace? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. That's what salvation is. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Now, we have this wacky idea of God today. If you, if you uh, spend too much time on the internet or social media or wherever, um, we have this wacky idea that God is like a, uh, like a, a great-grandfather with a great big beard down to about big white beard and he lives up in the clouds and he's always cranky and he's always sending down darts of, you know, floods and fires and and earthquakes and tidal waves and pestilence and, and, all, and wars. And that's God. He just, he's up there trying to make life miserable for us. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is this. He is full of grace. God is a gracious God. He loves being gracious to those who don't deserve his grace. That's where we all fit in, by the way. None of us deserve the grace of God. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace. But God is a gracious God. He loves to be gracious. God is full of grace. <clears throat> Something else about the Lord. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. God is all-holy. God is all-gracious. Chapter 2, where are we here? Oh, chapter 1 again. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his... Abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And again over in chapter 2 and verse 10, which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. Not only is God a God of grace, God is a God of mercy. He is a merciful God. What's the difference between grace and mercy? Grace is us getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is us not getting what we do deserve. But both ways, God is full of mercy. God is a merciful God. If you go and read the Psalms time and time and time again, it says his mercy endureth forever. 
His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. God as part of the, the attributes of God. He's a merciful God. <clears throat> I love the story of... Uh, has, has anyone been to New York? Um, I've flown into JFK, but I didn't actually go to New York. I've been, I've been to America many times. Um, but in New York, the, there are two main airports. There's the John F. Kennedy Airport, and then there's another one called LaGuardia Airport. Now, LaGuardia Airport was named after a man named Fiorella LaGuardia. He was the mayor of New York back in the 1930s, uh, during the, the height of the Great Depression. And uh, he was, I think he was about five foot three. He was just a little, little fella, obviously of Italian stock. And he always wore his suit. He wore a big broad-brimmed hat. And he always had a flower in his lapel, his, the lapel uh, of, of his jacket there, of his coat. And they called him the Little Flower. And he was very, very popular as, as, a, as a mayor of New York, helping guide the city through that terrible time of the Great Depression. Uh, and um, the story goes that one evening in January in, uh, in the early 1930s, they used to have in, uh, in New York City what was called night court. And um, they would have a, like a court sitting at night and, and they would, there would be a magistrate and they would, they would do the, the minor misdemeanours, minor crimes, and they would try those crimes at night court. Well, Mayor LaGuardia turned up to night court one night and, of course, you wouldn't be able to do this today, but he, he turned up. Everyone knew who he was. A little flower came in with his big hat and his flower hair, and he dismissed the judge or the magistrate. He said, you go and have the night off. I'm going to take over the chair for tonight. So he gets up in the, the judicial chair. He says, all right, to the, uh, the clerk of the court, he said, who's the first case? He said, Your Honour, Mr Mayor, there's this lady. lady comes in. She was a grandma. Um, so um, <clears throat> this lady came in. And uh, he said, all right, what's the, uh, what's the charge? He said, uh, Mr. Mayor, Your Honour, this lady um, is accused of stealing two loaves of bread from this man. And uh, Mayor Lagardia said, well, ma'am, um, how do you plead? She said, uh, Your Honour, I plead guilty. He said uh, then to the, the shopkeeper, he said, have you got anything you want to say? The man stood up, he said, well, Mr. Mayor, he said, I know it's only a couple of loaves of bread, but we don't want, this, this is a bad example for a grandmother to do this. It's a bad example for the young people of our city to do this. And um, I, th I think she needs to get what's coming to her. Mayor Lagardia said, okay, thank you for that. He said, uh, ma'am, he said, I find you guilty of stealing two um, loaves of bread from this man here. And according to the statutes, I fine you $10, which is a lot of money in those days, $10 or, uh, however many, I'm not sure how many months, six months or whatever in prison. And he said, moreover, and he said he took his hat off, his big hat off, he said, uh, and he got his, his wallet out and he took out a, a $10 note and he put it in the hat. He said, moreover, I'm going to remit this fine paid and he said moreover that I'm going to find every single person sitting in this courthouse for allowing this lady to live in a society where she has to steal to feed her grandchildren and they, he said I'm finding everyone 50 cents he passed the hat round and, the, and this is a true story you can look it up that poor that that old grandmother let she was bewildered she left the court with 53 dollars in her hand <laughs> that day true story you know what that was it's a beautiful picture of mercy. A beautiful picture of mercy. <clears throat> Why is that? Because she didn't deserve it. She did the wrong thing. But the judge said, I'm going to be merciful to you. By the way, mercy without payment is corruption. Just remember that. Mercy has to be paid for. And that's what God did with Jesus. He said, I'm going to be merciful to guilty sinners. And by the way, each and, each and every one of us are guilty sinners. I don't care who you are. You are a rotten, filthy, guilty sinner before God. I am. You are. That's the truth of the matter. Don't whitewash it. Our problem is sin. 
But God was merciful. He said, I'm going to extend my mercy to you. I'm going to extend my pardon and my forgiveness toward you on the basis of the payment of my son, Jesus Christ. God is a merciful God. Hey, I'm nearly done this morning. I know it's hot, but thanks for, thanks for listening. God is not only all-knowing and all-powerful and all-holy and gracious and merciful. God is marvellous. Look down at verse, uh, chapter 2, verse number 9. It says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. I want to focus on that word marvellous. You know God is a marvellous God. He's a marvellous God. You know, in the Gospels alone, 19 times it is announced that they marvelled at Jesus. You know, here's Jesus feeding the 5,000s. They just marvelled. Here's Jesus calming the storm. They marvelled. Uh, they kept marvelling at him. Why? Because he's marvellous. I love that word. It's a marvellous word, marvellous. But God is a marvellous God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory. How, how can you... <clears throat> not most probably going to see much, uh, many stars in Brisbane. Coffs Harbour's always cloudy. But when you go out west, how can you not look up at the sky on a, on a, on a moonless night, look at the stars and just think, God is marvellous. That's what God's like. They marvelled at Jesus. Here's my last point this morning. Where are we? Chapter 2, verse number 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he, that's Jesus, is precious. What is the Lord like? He is precious. And for the believer, those of us who believe Jesus is, is precious. He should be precious. Now, I often say this, the most precious person to me in all the planet Earth is my wife. I love my kids. I love my grandkids. I love my family. I think I love my brothers. Yeah, I love my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> but my wife is the most precious person to me in all the world. And I would die for her, defend her just in an instant. And I know you would too. Not for her, but for your wife or husband. <laughs> but, you know, compared to Jesus, he's more precious even than Robin to me. He's precious. Why is Jesus precious? Well, that's a whole sermon in itself. Some time back, I was reading through um, <clears throat> the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we won't turn there, Mark chapter 12. Remember the... Um, they were always trying to trick the Lord Jesus. The, the, um, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're always trying to trick him. And, and if they don't even realise you can't trick God, okay? <laughs> it's, not gonna, it's not gonna work. But they were trying. So they came to, to Jesus one day and they said, okay, Master, um, is it right that we should give tribute to Caesar? You know the story. In other words, should we pay our taxes to Caesar? What did Jesus do? This is what it says. It says, he asked for a coin. He borrowed a penny. And he got that penny and he said, whose superscription, well, whose picture's on that? He said, well, it's Caesar. He said, well, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Give to God the things that are God's. But the thing that struck me about that was he borrowed a penny. Why did Jesus have to borrow a penny? He didn't have one. He didn't have a penny. Someone came to Jesus one day and said, well, Lord, we're going to follow you wherever you go. He said, oh, okay, that's, that's really good. That's, that's, that's great. Yeah. He said, just remember, the birds have the nests, the foxes have their holes. I don't even have a pillow to lay my head on. So if that's the life you want, okay, go at it. Most of them took off. <laughs> you know, when, if, if you even go back to Jesus' birth, uh, <clears throat> as I said, we, we have... Uh, grand, we've got eight grandkids and uh, four kids, eight grandkids at, at least at the moment and um, <clears throat> and I know uh, when, our, when our kids were born Jesse's um, Jesse will be 39 is it this, this week Jesse will be 39 
Uh, and um, <clears throat> I know our, the stuff we had for Jesse was hand-me-downs, you know. Did we just, I think someone gave us a stroller and whatever. But when our youngest granddaughter was born last year, man, they had the, they had the Grace had the, the room all decked out with the, 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 the cot and the bassinet and the, whatever the two are, and the, you know, and the, the decor, de decorated walls. And man, it was like the, it was great, you know, for the little baby. You know, when Jesus was born, no hospital, no birthing unit, no motel, no doctor, no midwife, no, nothing, as they say. There was nothing. This is the creator of the universe coming to earth to be born as a human being. The God man, 100% God, yet 100% man. He came to earth. <clears throat> you, you cannot get any more poverty than being born in a stable. Because stables stink of camel droppings and sheep droppings and goat droppings and dirt and filth and so on. That's where he was born. No bassinet for Jesus. They stuck him in a, a little feeding trough. Wrapped him up in strips of cloth. Wow. He had to borrow a penny. Didn't have a pillow to lie on. It was Jesus that said to his disciples one day, they were meeting and he took his coat off and put a towel and he, he washed the disciples' feet. Hang on, that's, that's not your job, master. That's the servant's job. He says, well, I'm trying to teach you fellas something. That's what I am. I'm a servant. I'm a servant. They put him before the kangaroo court. They tried him unlawfully. He was sentenced to die. What did they do? It was prophesied that they would not tear up his coat. So they, they gambled for it, fulfill, fulfilling the scriptures. So he lost his clothing. We get this sanitized view of Jesus on the cross. Uh, you know, an artist's impression, but it was, it was we, we cannot imagine how, how bad it was for the creator of, uni of the universe when he hung on that cross. We cannot imagine that. And he lost his dignity. He lost everything, and then the only thing he had left was his blood. And he gave that up. He gave that up. He shed his blood for us. The Bible says, <clears throat> don't turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it says, he became poor so that we might become rich. That's why Jesus is precious. That's why he's precious. I bless the Christ of God. I rest on love divine. And with unfaltering lip and heart, I call this Saviour mine. And if you are a Christian, you, you can call Jesus precious. He gave everything, even his life's blood, to save me and to save you. What a Saviour he is. That's why for the rest of eternity, we will be singing the praise, praises to the Lamb. We'll be worshipping the Lamb. We'll be adoring the Lamb. We'll be honouring the Lamb. We'll be serving the Lamb. Why? Because He became poor so that we might become rich. He is precious. Now, if you are not a Christian, if you are a Christian this morning, you know what I, you know what I want to do every morning? I want to, when I wake up, I'm going to run to my study or run to wherever, whatever you, place you've got at home, out in the back paddock, I don't know, and say, Jesus, I need to spend some time with you today because you are precious. And if he is precious to you, you need to give him the time that he deserves. But if you are not a Christian this morning, if you do not know 100% for sure that you are saved, that there was a time when Jesus came into your life, when you were born again, my friend, you need to taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, how, I'm, I'm, this is my last point. How do you do that? How do you taste and see that the Lord is good? Come back to our text verse. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And verse 8, 
It says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Here's the second part. Blessed or blessed is the man that trusteth in him. It's pretty simple. In fact, it is simple. It's trust, or we could, we could use the word faith. Faith. That's how you become a Christian. That's how you receive Christ. It's by faith. It's not by works. It's not by religion. It's not by anything else. It's by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him, there's that word faith again, believeth on him, should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, how do I receive Jesus as my Saviour so that he becomes precious to me? It's by faith. You must just believe. Believe that Jesus died in your place, that he shed his blood for your sins and for the sins of the world. 1 Corinthians 10, uh, Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friend, I'm not asking you to climb Mount Everest. I'm not asking you to build a multi-billion dollar corporation. I'm just saying, come as a sinner to Jesus. You come in faith, he'll do the saving. Why? Because he's a wonderful saviour. I wonder if there's someone here this morning, most probably, and this is a really good crowd this morning, most probably there's someone here this morning, you might be a bit religious, but you're not saved. My friend, this is the day. This is the day of salvation. I'm asking you this morning, come to Christ Come to Christ. Come and bow yourself before him as a filthy, hell-deserving sinner. Believe that he died for you and that he was buried and he rose again. That's the gospel. Come and take Christ as your saviour this morning. Let's have every head bowed and eyes closed, please. I'm going to pray in just a moment and then we'll have our last song and then I'll hand back to, uh, to Pastor Matt to come and close and do whatever you do. But I wonder if there's someone here this morning while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just, um, <clears throat> just to respect everyone's privacy here, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but I do want to ask the question, is there someone here this morning and you'd say, Preacher, I don't understand all that you've said this morning, but one thing I do understand, that I am not a Christian. I am not a born-again child of God. But I see my need this morning. I see my need as a guilty sinner. I see my need and I, I want to respond to the message. And this is how I want you to respond. And by the way, putting your hand up doesn't save anyone, but it's giving you an invitation to respond to the message. If that's you this morning, you say, Preacher, would you pray for me in your closing prayer? I see my need. I'm not a Christian, but I want to know more about having Christ in my life. Just put your hand up and put it down again. Is there one person? Would you say, Preacher, that's me this morning? I'm not going to call your name out because I most probably don't even know it. Is there someone you'd say, Preacher, that's me. I don't know that I'm a Christian, but I need to be saved today. I want to respond to the message. Just quickly put that hand up. I'll include you in the prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord. You're a wonderful God. And Lord, if, if, if we'll just taste and see that you are good all the time, you're a wonderful God. Jesus is a wonderful Saviour. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here this morning, they don't know Jesus Christ as their saviour. They've never come to that point in their life of accepting Jesus by faith, based on the promises of God's word. Then, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will not let them go. Convict them of their need. Draw them to the saviour, we pray. Bless our time, our closing hymn this evening, uh, this morning. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.